Welcome to the Railway Series Book Club, the podcast where we dissect the Railway Series. I'm Jamie. I'm Marina. I'm Vivian. And we hope you enjoy the show. I'm sorry, everybody, but this week Book Club has been cancelled because in in the time between the recording of safe from scrap and the recording of this episode uh i have fallen deeply into obsession with pokemon scarlet and violet and that is all my brain has space for anymore so uh podcast over everyone go i'm home. free <laughs> <laughs> i never have to think about the railway series again <laughs> Mario, you can finally do your stupid fucking anime podcast <laughs> oh yeah okay so today we're gonna be talking about love life superstar um <laughs> i didn't Look, prepare okay, this okay, so people <laughs> people people may joke about the fucking graphics and i will concede this game absolutely needed another year or two in the oven and game freak needs to fucking unionize already however the product that was delivered reg- delivered regardless of all of that is the best pair of Pokemon games since Pokemon Black and White. Now then! <laughs> Honestly, that's what I've been uh, hearing a lot, and I... The, the, the positive reception has made me consider getting it, because I like I, I like Pokemon, I just didn't like the look of it pre-release. Yeah, I didn't like the look of it pre-release either. I was honestly just kind of planning on skipping it initially, because it looked... You know, it looked like it might be a bit better, but, like, I honest After Sword and Shield and Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl... I didn't even touch Legends Arceus. I'm kind of reconsidering that now. Legends, having played this, Legends but... was fun. I liked Legends. Yeah, and I, I I had fun with Sword and Shield at first, then I really fell off. Yeah. I tolerated Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl at first, and then I fell off that without Sword, even Sword completing and Shield, the game. Sword and Shield was fun insofar as that it was a new Pokemon game with some really good Pokemon designs and absolutely no further. Yeah. The good thing about one of the good things about Scarlet and Violet is that it basically takes everything that was good about Sword and Shield and puts it in a good game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the only point I have against it is that uh, trainer customization is nowhere near as good as it was in Sword. Yeah, and why Shield. can't you take off the stupid uniform? I want to take off my fucking school uniform. Like I, I loved being, I, I love being a, a gay bad bitch when my fashion senses in Pokemon. They really <laughs> wanted to make sure you get the authentic school experience of you aren't allowed to have any individuality whatsoever. <laughs> I already went through that. I live in England. We all have to wear uniforms. <laughs> I I've never had to wear a school uniform because I sucks. you know it it yeah. fu- it is terrible. Welcome to the really serious book club, the podcast where we uh, dissect uh, those books about trains. I'm Jamie, the Queen of Sodor. Are <laughs> you Marina, your local TV series batch? <laughs> I I'm Vivian. Uh, I'm British. I'm reading the book. Also, my pronouns are she they. Um, All right, my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> I said mine. <laughs> I'm just used to being part of the intro. I forgot. Uh, I forgot. That's why I, I I don't change my lines. So I have it all the way. To- <laughs> <laughs> well, you two have defined roles. I'm just the British one. Yeah, that's a defined role. You're our token minority. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'm impressed. Gay, this series would have a very <laughs> big problem with diversity. <laughs> if that's the, uh, the token minority role we have. <laughs> Finally, I'm oppressed. I can know how my ancestors made everyone on Earth feel. <laughs> Today, we are finishing our look at Edward the Blue Engine and talking about Old Iron. It's old. It's, uh, it's, it's good. It's really good. It's always I been one, one of my favorite episodes since I was a kid. This, it was included. Is it because James is in it? 
Yes, it's because James is in it. Uh, also because it was on Best of James, and I'd always rewatch that uh, DVD, even though uh, fucking the that one clip in Dirty Objects scared the shit out of me. <laughs> there was actually a clip in this episode that scared the shit out of me. It's like I don't know why, but the opening where James is just like looking at the camera and his angry face used to scare me because I fucking hated that face as a kid. <laughs> like I think he's like coming towards the camera too. <laughs> I I love how every like I love how every I love how basically nobody's childhood experience being scared by Thomas. It's never because any of the dark elements, like the scrap or the dieselization. Oh no, that scared me too. It's just jarring shots like that. <laughs> Here's the thing. I never made it that far in episodes. <laughs> like, I I never got... I, I'm pretty sure I had spills and chills as a kid. I never made it to Stepney Gets Lost. <laughs> <laughs> because I was scared by the earlier ones. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over I'm over here like, oh yeah, yeah, the trains have to deal with the demonic ghosts of those long dead. My favorite episodes. I made my parents fucking throw out my VHS <laughs> Percy's ghostly trick. And like, I wouldn't let them just like put it away or something. I made them get rid of it because I thought it was, like, possessed or something. I never even saw any of the other episodes on it as a kid because literally just the opening shot <laughs> scared the shit out of me. What, did, did, you, did you get through, like, the... I probably not is the thing. <laughs> See, I, I, I always... I, you know, I was a little bit scared by Ghost Train, but it was only, like, the crash part just because of the way it was framed. Nothing else about the episode ever, like, really scared me that much, but I could I, never remember the ending for whatever reason. I think I, I did watch it at some point because I remember seeing the clip of Percy hitting the thingy, and I don't think it was from a, like, music video but yeah. like I think they kept that clip in like the promo for the DVDs at the beginning of every like DVD. Yeah, I just remember out of the seeing it in the and plot. into your home. Is that a threat? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> See, I I said this before, the only thing in Thomas that ever scared me ever was Diesel 10. He he terrified me oh, when same. I was younger. But I loved Ghost Train, I loved Duncan Gets Spooked, I loved Haunted Henry, I loved Stepney Gets Lost. I, I've i liked Rusty to the Rescue, mostly because of the scenes in the scrapyard. I, like, so you love that spooky shit. We have I, one. Well, one. <laughs> in fairness, I am a ghost. So, you know, it's my brand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I no, I remember. I like, I like, like the spooky in, ones. Yeah, getting back on the topic of the episode, though, I remember. I feel like this episode in general used to be really revered by fans in the same way as the Flying Kipper, because like it's got it's got a good tone and its music is good and it's got the cool visuals. And nowadays, I don't really see that kind of sentiment anymore. I don't think it's because people have changed their minds, but it's been. But it's more like nobody feels the need to rave on about it anymore. Which is a shame, like, because I, this one has know. actual substance. Yeah, like, you know, the I, it's a much more steps, you know, the legendary cool story status is far more substantial here than Flying Kipper. I think it's because... Fly, Flying we, Kipper got popular because it was pretty. Flying yeah. Kipper is the episode people use when they're like, Oh, Thomas isn't a kid show, look at the artistry, and all of that. So it still remains relevant in conversation, whereas this is more of a standard episode, and, like, obviously I think it's the better of the two. Um, but, like, I, I feel like it's partially because season two has gotten not less revered, but, like, there's less conversation around it more, because usually people now bring up seasons four and five or we're getting to the point where six, seven, and eight come up a lot because, like, the demographics shifting. Yeah, like ten years ago, the main 
people were still, like, people that frequented the, like, Sodor Island forms and stuff who probably grew up with, like, seasons one, two, and maybe three. So apparently the story is based on an incident from the United States of America in which an Alco diesel switcher ran away from its yard and had to be lassoed like a cowboy roping a steer, allowing the crew to scramble across and take control. Yeehaw! I, I thought when you said in America before, like, it being a diesel switcher, I thought it was just, like, one of the fucking giant steam engines we used to have, which would have been really Oh, no, if it was a, it was like a fucking really big boy, dangerous. that shit would have not been stopped by that. A big boy? A big boy running away with no crew? <laughs> that, Honestly, nothing could like, have stopped that thing. I feel like most American steam engines would have been like fucking crazy hard to stop with how fucking huge yeah, they were. Like, actually, you know, what? I think I don't remember what the top speed of a big boy is, but I I know the Challengers are pretty fast, and those are like pretty. Those are like mini big boys. Well, the thing with the big boy is it wouldn't be the speed that would be the problem. It would be actually getting it to stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because American engines are fucking huge. Yeah. Like, even... The, the thing with it is, even if you got into the cab, how long it would take it just to slow down because of just how heavy it is? <laughs> how much shit it'd probably barrel through. It'd be really funny. <laughs> Someone should yeah. do a fan story where, like, fucking Hank becomes <laughs> run away and is just <laughs> demolishing everything in his path. Loading gauge. I think it's really cool that Audrey used an incident from an American railroad. Like, obviously, it's just because yeah. it probably showed up in one of his uh, railroading magazines in the UK. But, like, I really like that, you know, the basis is for the stories on Sodor aren't the necessarily of always Sodor. British railways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are the stories of Sodor. No! <laughs> Old Iron. One day, James had to wait at Edward's station till Edward and his train came in. This made him cross. Late again, he shouted. Edward only laughed, and James fumed away. Edward is impossible, he grumbled to the others. He clanks about like a load of old iron, and then he is so slow he makes us wait. Thomas and Percy were indignant. Old iron? They snorted. Slow? Why, Edward could beat you in a race any day. Really? said James huffily. I should like to see him do it. I think this is the only time that Thomas, Percy, and James interact as a trio it is. in the books. It is. Which, like, it's really weird, because, like, I feel like they only really started interacting regularly from, like, season three onwards, because that's when they became the marketing trio. And, like, honestly, if I didn't know any better, I'd assume this was something they made up for the TV version. Here's the thing. Even in the classic series, they only really... Like, Tom, it's usually almost always Percy and James, and then Thomas is there to be like, at least we're all friends at the end. <laughs> like, I, I... We have a really useful after they all. They don't have a significant interaction between Thomas and James until season 8, I'm pretty sure. And then there isn't a significant... They don't start using them as a trio in episodes with, like, a dynamic and stuff until fucking King of the Railway. <laughs> it, yeah. the, most, the most substantial Thomas and James interaction I can think of is, like, trust Thomas? Yeah. It's they get all... There's Trust Thomas. There's also, uh, what's it called? I'm pretty sure they also interact pretty directly in... No uh, joke for James. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> It's. I just mean like they don't really have much of a dynamic until. No, the only yeah. the only thing we know about the two of them from those two episodes is that Thomas is way too trusting of James's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they uh, they also interact kind of directly a few times in James and the Trouble with Trees. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a. Th that's probably the first Thomas and James episode, like truly. Yeah. And Edward's there for two seconds. And yeah, so was Henry. Seconds. <laughs> yeah. In in a, in a Henry appears in a shot that is like and has a crash that just totally 
flips the middle finger to the rule of thirds. I love that they just fucking uh, put, like, a brick on the track to make them yeah. crash. Like, I think you can see it. <laughs> I... I will say for the for the funny page, I do like the phrasing of Edward is impossible. Oh my god. It, that is very good phrasing. And you know, I really like the Thomas and Percy stick up for Edward. Yeah. yeah. Like honestly, I, I I don't think I, I don't think I could see them not sticking up for Edward, like, you know, in the first place, but like I really like that the little engines recognize that Edward is cool. Yeah, and they establish before this that Edward and Percy, like, at least have, like, a friendship, because they focus a lot on, like, Edward showing Percy shit and, like, teaching yeah. him both how to and, mess and around Edward and, and how to not die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, like, you know, we know Edward and Thomas like each other from Thomas and the Trucks, and, like, based on how we know that, you know, Thomas and Edward were the first two engines, and, like, the only two engines owned by the Northwestern Railway for a long time... Like, you know, obviously they have a pretty close bond. Yeah. So, it's, it like, these these two are, like, it makes a lot of sense that they stand up for Edward. This, this is just a random thing that popped into my head, because you, you talked about, like, Edward showing Percy how to do shit, and also how not to get murdered. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me think about the, the fucking, I think the Mean Scarlet Deceiver post about Harvey, and how they have to try and teach him the really complex, like... S- like social, like social fucking web of bullshit, as to who's allowed to get the coal first and who's allowed to cut in front of who and when and why. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that post, but that sounds really fun. Yeah, it, it the whole thing is Harvey's an industrial engine, so he never got oh, exposed yeah. to like the complicated yard politics of mainline operations. Ooh. So, so Thomas, who's been there since the beginning and has watched everything develop, is trying to show Harvey, hey, this is how this works. And Thomas doesn't know why that's how it works, he just knows that that's how it ended up. Alright, so, so on the totem pole, you're at the very <laughs> bottom, even though realistically you <laughs> should be at the top, considering you're the one that helps us when we all fuck up, but th- 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 that doesn't matter. <laughs> it, Unfortunately, it's... your usefulness does not matter to the big engine's ego. <laughs> That also it also has a very fun sequence of um, they they all they all jokingly kind of call him Cranky on Wheels as like a kind of fun kind of mocking nickname, but there's a thing where oh maybe Harvey is gonna have to go away because he's not technically owned by the Northwestern, and everyone's like okay no, he's a bit of an idiot but he's our idiot and you're not taking him. One other thing about this page is uh. The dialogue in the TV version is literally one-to-one with the book. Yeah. And yet it feels so much faster paced on the page than it does in the episode. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, they had to stitch together transition shots and add in filler sequences for it. And that added a bit of meat to it, I guess. It's just really weird to think about. <laughs> it's because you're actually, I think, hearing it spoken and like a back and forth conversation rather than text on the page if that makes sense they also have uh there's the little bit where like james rolls his eyes before saying something which i i like it's really yeah. smooth like <laughs> how they do it hmm. yeah i i think... they also have you know the james spinning on the turntable for 30 seconds i think the issue with them timing this episode out is this one is very heavy on human stuff later like yeah. not to like a dangerous degree but like you know there's a lot of stuff that they couldn't show really yeah. that would have taken up time like you know I'm obviously getting ahead of it but the actual sequence of the kids fucking with James and then running off we couldn't see that yeah yeah. I feel like then there's a, and there's a, there's like a lot of expositional dialogue with like James's sick driver that gets cut as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, there there's we're going to get out get into that in the next page. <laughs> yeah. I will say before we move on to the next page though, I love like James like trying to give Edward shit. Edward just laughing in response and then James immediately just going to get pissed. <laughs> and, like just yeah. getting pissed and shit talking to others about it. 
Join the Discord and tell us to add the advertisement for the Discord to the opening. We're never going to remember otherwise. <laughs> no, we're not adding it to the opening! One day, James's driver did not feel well when he came to work. I'll manage, he said. But when they reached the top of Gordon's Hill, he could hardly stand. The fireman drove the train to the next station. He spoke to the signalman, put the trucks in the siding, and uncoupled James ready for shunting. Then, he helped the driver over to the station, and asked them to look after him, and find a relief. Suddenly, the signalman shouted, and the fireman turned round and saw James puffing away! I- Oh no! I love this image! Just the fucking, like- <laughs> Just, like, the guy, like, reaching out as James is just moving, <laughs> the guy running as James is just moving in the background. <laughs> yeah. So, so a lot of this is cut down in the TV series, because, you know, humans and Thomas and friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it'd be really cool if we got, you know, like, a, a CGI version of this that actually, like, showed some of this. I think we've you know. realized through this book is... This book would do really well with a CGI re-adaptation. Yeah. It really would. In an alternate universe where the Bren of, where the Renaissance survived uh, past season 21 and, like, you know, didn't have to deal with the brand's collapse and big world and shit, uh, this would have been a really cool 80th anniversary special, I think. Yeah. yeah. I uh... Oh, that would, that would have been fun. Also, uh, if we're keeping track of on the map... He he should be fra at Marin now. Yes. In the middle of nowhere, so. you mean. <laughs> <laughs> we were at Marin. In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> this is getting ahead a bit, but I really do feel like this episode is, the story is one of the kind of many that could benefit from like a modern or animated adaption. Because I feel like... Being able to do the Edward and James chase more on the scale of, like, the Thomas and James one in Adventure Begins would yeah. benefit a lot. That would have been so cool! Yeah. Like, they they do a really good job with the limitations imposed on them in the, the oh, TV yeah. series that yeah. we got. We're, but, like, like, seeing it, like, animated in CGI would just be the why? Yeah. Why? The, I also the, chef's the, kiss. I, the extended shot of like the two of them running and then it raises up over the bridge and then it goes back down to them is so good. Oh, it is. Yes! This episode is amazingly shot and kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think it honestly is a better example of the models as a film tool than something like Flying Kipper because like everything in it is it heightens the story <laughs> like they, there, yeah, there's also yeah. some creative ways that they like show off like how to they use they're obviously limited on what they can do but they use what they have to a really strong advantage and it's it works really well yeah, <laughs> yeah. this i think this book is some of the best stories that they got adapted for season two and there were some good ones in season two. Oh, yeah definitely yeah season two has got a lot of good stuff in it you know it, it's like there's a reason to an extent that a lot of people revere it so much yeah <laughs> they basically... season 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 three is still a little bit better though i'm just gonna say for i like season three a lot for better or season three is a very pretty season for better or worse they basically adapt the second half of the railway series in series two and yeah th there's yeah, issues that I... form from that but it also means that there's some of the best episodes and stories in the franchise in that it's one period. of the most it's one of the most action-packed yeah. and most consistently good seasons, I think. There's a lot of shit yeah. in series two. Like, we're in... This is literally just after Gordon's book, and then it it goes all the way up to, like, not counting the Thomas stories. Like, what? It goes fucking... all the way to the end of the Rev's run. Yeah. And, like, you know, it isn't any percent speed run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like you can tell that, like, they kind of had a thing where, like, 
they hit a lot more stories that they couldn't do or didn't want to do for one reason or another. And then yeah. to get around that, they kind of just kept going forward. And like, that's arguably not the, the best choice, but also the it big, does the, mean we get a lot of good shit in one season. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the big thing with it is when we get past this we're getting into the Skalawi books. Yeah, and they just which, couldn't adapt those. They couldn't yeah. adapt those, and that's four stories for every 12 episodes that you just can't do. Yeah. Which, considering that there's only... How many stories are there in the Revs run? Twi- uh, one, 105. 105, so... 105. So 26 times 4 plus 1. Okay, so 105 minus 4... 8, 12, 16, 18, 20, minus 24 episodes, well, I don't, mean, don't, if, if, if we're counting all the, yeah. all the, all of the, like, narrow Every gauge narrow gauge stuff. and not just Scarlowy Railway. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And there's, like, one or two, I swear there's, like, one or two even outside the... Yeah, because they don't they, do Golden Goes over s- They don't do Golden Goes they don't do, they don't do They don't Stepney do Stepney's stuff. book. Stepney... Stepney's the pretty major one they skipped over. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not. I'm not sure why, but like, I, you know, we. I. I, I feel. I guess it was probably because they prioritized the Bill and Ben stories. I'm because they're marketable? Question mark. I'm guessing with this is a complete crack theory, but I'm guessing with Stepney and with um. Thomas and the special it was Brit, letter. Probably. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was partially because they needed um or they didn't want to fully explore the world outside of Sodor. If yeah, that makes sense. That, that makes sense. And we also know they didn't have the budget to do Gordon Goes Foreign, so they probably wouldn't have had the budget to throw in like even more characters, I guess. They also didn't have the budget. They definitely didn't have the budget to do like super rescue. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. I'm just I'm I'm mainly pitching season two with Stepney book instead of mainline engines. Yeah, which you know the the downside in that is that we don't get Boko and Bill and Ben in season two, which you know, and we don't get Wrong Road and all that other all those other good stories. I'm guessing eh. I'm guessing it's because also they probably would have needed to explore dieselization a lot and a lot of those are they would have either needed to change a lot in bluebells of england and um stepney special i think that like they probably weren't allowed to in season two because this was still fairly season two they start to make some pretty substantial not not as substantial but like they start making tweaks in the stories well, by this point. Nothing. I feel do... like they probably could have truncated Bluebells of England and Stepney Special into one cohesive story. But also, they 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 could have, but they probably didn't want to because if they truncated it, they probably still would have had to bring up a lot of the real world stuff, which we yeah. later learned Brit was really opposed to, for better or worse. I'm not commenting on that, but. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of the reason because they didn't want to yeah. deal with all the yeah. real world implications. And I feel like Stepney until maybe even more than enterprising engines is definitely the book that most deals with what's going, what was going on in the real world when it was published. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Mari probably hasn't. Jamie, have you read the MSD Stepney post? I have. It's really good. Yeah. Like th- there are two different Stepney posts that came out around the same time. One of them's less about Stepney and more about the interactions between uh you know, Percy and Douglas in Bluebells of England. But yeah. like I really like both of them. They're really good. Uh shout outs to Joby Mean Scarlet Deceiver. Uh you are awesome. I'm very honored that you've been listening to the podcast. Yeah, your stuff's <laughs> really cool. You're really cool and really nice. <laughs> He ran hard, but he couldn't catch James, and soon he came back to the signal box. The signalman was busy. All traffic halted, he announced at last. Up and down main line to clear for 30 miles, and the inspector's coming. The fireman mopped his face. What happened? he asked. 
Two boys were on the footplate. They tumbled off and went and ran when James started. I shouted at them and they ran like rabbits. Just let me catch them, said the fireman grimly. I'll teach them to meddle with my engine. Fucking... I love All Traffic Halted. Oh, it's so like, good. Any episode, it just It just says All Traffic Halted and it just shows a, like a, a whole thing of the signals going. It's, oh, it's such I a love quick it. shot and transition, but it tells you every... It basically tells you everything you need and if you don't know what it means, it looks cool, so it works. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this this is also just a I like I like extra detail thing. I love the up and down lines are clear for thirty miles. That's like a fun little oh, thing. Yeah. That that's a fun little thing. That it if you did a re readaptation of this, that would also give an interesting kind of time limit. Because Edward only yeah, has like 30 you have thirty miles. miles to catch like James. how fast is how fast is James going? Like, cause if he's going like you know, if he's going like you know. If he ends up going like maybe like sixty miles an hour, he only has half, like an, hour half to get an hour. Him. You have half an hour to stop him from hitting some James is supersonic <laughs> race. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like actually, Im like just imagine though, imagine this but framed under the guise of like there is a hard time limit yeah, before that's something yeah, goes that was really so wrong. So fucking cool. <laughs> Like, obviously, that's not the angle they take. They just kind of make it, like, a fun action story, which is also great. But Yeah, like, this, that, could this have, is good. This could have but... been so much more dire with just a little bit of, like, rewriting. This is one of the stories yeah, that there's like a this, lot this you could, can This do is with. literally just unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> point. Yeah, this is literally which the premise I, of that movie, I'm pretty sure, just outside I, I of the did I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did learn. I did learn a, a, a little while ago that was also based on a real thing. Yeah, and it's based on a CSX locomotive called Crazy Eights because its number was eight 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 eight. Uh, <laughs> running away. <laughs> I think it got Crazy Eights as a name after the incident. Yeah, yeah. Crazy Eights is the but... name of the demolition derby in Cars Three. Mari, wow. I'm gonna pick you up and throw you into a river. <laughs> <laughs> This canonically exists in the Chorus universe because they celebrate Christmas and you canonically die because they celebrate Easter. Wait, Mari, I thought you were going to say, did you know Jesus will make you repent? <laughs> repent, bitch. I just, I just, I'm going to throw you in the river. Jesus will make you suffer. <laughs> we all face oh. Jesus eventually. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> anyway, um, I love James's driver being ready to fucking throw hands with some children over his engine. It's yeah, it's both cute and yeah. really funny. <laughs> They're firemen. It, it seems to be a theme of the story. Um, more about that later. So, whose kids are these? Like, it, why are they just in the railway yard? They kind of well, in it is like. It is, like, early, like, 40s Britain, so the kids are just kind of left to be little menaces. Yeah, and they imply, oh, they imply that they just like to go and look and watch at the train, so they're probably just some random fucking kids that were hanging around and then saw a fucking engine without anything on it and were like, hey, let's, let's go, let's go, like, check that out, and then fell off while accidentally sending him flying. <laughs> Yeah. I yeah. I'm just I'm really thinking about the idea of this story but like with a time limit imposed and that's so like that's such an interesting like angle you could take for this. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know we already talked in that but it's like I I'd that... never thought about it like that before but now that I am I really want that. <laughs> yeah. Cuz it's you know, let's be honest, if Edward wasn't the closest one, they wouldn't have picked him for this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Edward Edward is not the character he's not the engine you want in a chase. Yeah, you'd want someone like Gordon or like if she's even here at this point like like Gordon like someone I mean to be fair Edward was made to pull expresses. He can probably hit 90 miles an hour if he's just running light engine. You know. But he's also maybe not, not in, in the his, present in prime yeah. at the moment. No, he is, he is not in his prime. <laughs> he is not in a good way in most of this story. Yeah, most of this book, he's, you know, he's fucking clanking, you know? You know, Edward's clearly worn out in this book. He's not 
he's not on his A game. So maybe he could have caught James quite easily if he was well maintained, but he's not at the moment. He is not like a healthy engine. And they've given him like you know, if saying if James went up to around sixty, which is probably around his limit. Maybe a little bit high, maybe a little bit lower. If he's going at sixty, Edward has at most half an hour to get up to speed, stay at speed, not break, and and stay level with him. Yeah. Which I, f- I feel like to be you know to be fair to Edward here you know James probably you know he's probably not started at sixty going out of the yard but like no. he'll get there you know he'll... he doesn't have his driver in his cab the the kid the the kid's probably left the regulator like open like he's probably accelerating and that's the thing is Edward's not in the yard when this happens because they say Edward's coming in yeah the next they call him in. So they had to get him up to speed on what's happening, get the inspector, get him down to fucking Marin from Wellsworth, which would be up the hill, which even light engine isn't going to be easy for him. So he's probably setting off on the pursuit with James at like 50. Yeah, Edward's Edward's at a real disadvantage here. Yeah. Somebody, it- some, somebody, somebody do something with this idea, please. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, it, I've said this. If this this is one of the episode or this is one of the stories that I feel like there's a lot of angles you could really go for an expanded telling yeah. of it, and it's yeah, it, it's it's a really good one. <laughs> like, spoilers. This is Audrey's first really good action story, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like there I are mean, how run- many action stories have there been up until well, now? Well, like, there's been Runaways before, but this is the first one where it's like, oh, this is intense. Yeah, I feel like this is the first story where the action is really the main draw of it. Because like, I mean, what else is there? There's like Thomas and Gordon. Percy runs away. There are Runaways, but like they don't. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe Percy runs away. You could argue that. Eh. But also, they're not like you know. Percy runs away doesn't feel particularly dire, I think. No. Like, you know, he's scared and frightened, but, like, you know, a nice signalman is like, oh, don't worry, Percy, I'll help you out, and just diverts him into a mud bank or whatever. Yeah, and, <laughs> like, Thomas and Birdie. I don't mean to bit of my sad story, but, like... Thomas and Birdie is kind of to- eventful, but, like, it's a lot more casual, I Fun. guess. Fun. Yeah. It's like... Yeah. It's a there, race. There's... Actually, I guess there's Birdie's chase is also... You know, we discovered that was pretty exciting when yeah. we viewed it through the, light, the right lens. Yeah. So, so, this book's really just doing wonders for, you know, this kind of exciting storytelling, I guess. I, I guess also with that, though, is Birdie's chase was just... <coughs> there was no danger, really. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Like, the worst case scenario is, like, 12 people are a bit late for work. Whereas in this, James yeah. is gonna mow down a bunch of pedestrians <laughs> in a crossing or something. He's going to be like Edward. <laughs> and his snow plow. But on intention. <laughs> oh dear. I'm perfectly okay with taking the lives of innocents, but James hasn't been hardened by war. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the idea that, like... James... I, I didn't know this was the token. The idea that James talks a ton of shit... But, like, would crumble the minute he accidentally hurt somebody. But, like, Edward is just, like... It's like, yeah, shit's life is kind of badass. <laughs> I kind of like inevitable. it. Mari. This is not actually what happens in the token, but I feel like thematically, <laughs> this is reminding me of the token. Yeah, a little but bit. It's really hard for me to not think of the token during this, because it's literally about Edward and James. But Mari, I'll watch please, it. I please need God to. listen to the token. I know I need it's to. Just, I'm just imagining just Edward just goes up to James, just, Don't worry, James. Death is inevitable. It hardly matters if you accelerate the process. <laughs> <laughs> Then he leaves, and James is just like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Apathetic Edward. God. Still better than the stories of Sodor, Edward. (laughs) Is that a challenge? No, but... (laughs) Exactly. I mean, it's very easy to be better than Victor Tanzig Kin. Victor Tanzig Coon. 
Both men jumped as the telephone rang. Yes, answered the signalman. He's here. Right, I'll tell him. The inspector's coming up once in Edward. He wants a shunter's pole and a coil of wire rope. What for? wondered the fireman. Search me, but you better find him quickly. The fireman was ready and waiting when Edward arrived. The inspector saw the pole and rope. Good man, he said. Jump in. We'll catch him. We'll catch him, puffed Edward, crossing to the up line in pursuit. I love... I love the inspector's, like, fashion in the book. He's got... Yeah. Like, he's, he's wearing, like, a leather jacket, he's got a mustache. Like, he looks like a cool action hero. But in the TV series, he's just another blue guy in a suit. Yeah. This, wait, <laughs> hang on. So... Or a guy in a blue suit, sorry. So, wait, <laughs> if Edward's on the upline, that means James is wrong roading. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. So, that's, um, that's even more doubly dangerous, because that means there might just be an engine. Yeah, the, James at, is gonna plow, James is gonna plow face first into fucking Henry, sitting there with his <laughs> slow goods. <laughs> okay, but imagine if, like, instead of them easing him to a stop, like, in the middle of nowhere, they ease, they, like, they get him within, like, within eye shot of Henry. If Edward wasn't oh, if Edward God. wasn't fast enough, there would have been a Henry three. <laughs> <laughs> Henry would have freaked the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, James? What are you doing? Ah! Okay. I'm just imagining just Henry's just like, why are we stopped? There's nothing on the line. What's the point? And then James comes round a curve. It's just like. Oh fuck! Hey, okay, but imagine, <laughs> and then and then you and then you hear fucking like a clanking and wheezing and rattling, and Edward just comes around the corner as well. It's like, I'm I'm here, I'm here to save the day. <laughs> well, I've lived a good life. <laughs> I okay, but imagine if like. Audrey just decided Henry was eternally the engine that would be in, like, whenever there's a bad accident, he'd be the one involved. <laughs> and, like, in the and war, they were just fault. all different Henrys. <laughs> just, like, 20 oh Henrys so by the funny. end of the, <laughs> the it's like It's like when, it's like when parents buy a lot of the same toy because the kid keeps breaking it. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a cupboard of Henry's just waiting they're, for the new one to they're die. They're all, like, different classes and shit. Like, they're just painted up to look like Henry. <laughs> no, wait, it's... What if, that, what if that's the deal with fucking Henry in season two, and the reason he has a splashers again is because he had another accident. Yeah. And got replaced by Henry three, and that's Henry three in the TV series. And by... By the... By the... The... CGI seasons, it's like Henry fucking 25, and that's why he's suddenly, like, afraid of everything, because he's gotten good reason to. <laughs> they just give him he the memories how of, many. They've given him the memories of dying, like, 80 times. <laughs> I was not the first. I will not be the last. <laughs> Going back to the inspector, though, I... This is another reason why I wish we had a more defined human cast, because yeah. I think it'd be really cool if this cool-ass guy was a series regular. Like, they gave him a name and let him appear in a whole bunch of other instances where an inspector shows up. Like, Thomas goes fishing or what have you. Yeah. Even if even if he didn't have a name, they could kind of use him like they did the uh, Grumpy Passenger in CGI, where it's just, like, always the same guy, which is really funny. <laughs> James was laughing as he left the yard. What a lark! What a lark! He chuckled to himself. Presently, he missed his driver's hands on the regulator. And then he realised there was no one in his cab. What shall I do? He wailed. I can't stop! Help! Help! We're coming! We're coming! Edward was panting up behind with every ounce of steam he had. With a great effort, he caught up and crept alongside, slowly gaining till the smoke box was level with James's buffer beam. Damn, James... What makes him realize um, that something's wrong is him missing the touch of another man on his insides. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, but two things. Um, J or like three things. Sorry. Uh, James like just like fucking enjoying himself. 
and like then he doesn't even realize something is wrong until he's like fucking like barreling down. <laughs> Main line is f yeah. That is, he's just so fucking unaware. He's like, "Wow, my driver's really, my crew's really cool. We're just a fucking, <laughs> we're we're not we're not pulling the goods train. Yay! Uh, you want to like this is a bit fast. You want to you want to slow down? I, I also like I I've always like found the the phrasing of he missed his driver's hand on the regulator to be so like strange just because it's like what. How is that supposed to mean? Like, I miss my daddy? Like, he... I think it's, I think it's, like, he's, he's probably used to, like, having the driver take over in, like, certain instances on the line, and then he's like, oh, he didn't do anything this time. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Barreling down the freeway. Edward sweatband. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. He looks like he's wearing a fucking bandana, and, like, I, I didn't realize as a kid that it was, like, what was holding the fucking dude in place or whatever. I just thought it looked yeah. cool. <laughs> I never realized that, like, the, the highlighting on Edward's lip was supposed to be highlighting. I thought he had a really e stupid evil grin with one tooth. <laughs> Like what the fuck is wrong with your face, bro? <laughs> I I I do love the description of Edward coming up alongside. Just just the way it's all written's good. Yeah, it it it's really cool. I This is a small thing. I don't even know if it was intentional, but in the TV series like the shots of Edward like where he's like trying to catch up it looks like he's like rocking and clanking the entire time in a way the models yeah. don't normally yeah. and i really well, like that's that just kinda, <laughs> yeah that's just kind of how edward's model is when it runs just because it's got like a weird like it's got a fucked up wheelbase where like the driving wheels are like really far back and really small and don't yeah like, a lot of the weight is over the front wheels uh but the front wheels don't have a lot of support so when it so when the motor is just running, it'll, like, rock a bit. And you can see that on, like, Bachman Edward, too, when you, like, get that running. Yeah. Which, it's, it's not as pronounced, though. But I think the fact that, that that actually does add to the effect a lot. Yeah. The fact that you can... It seems oh, like he's, absolutely. Really, he's it's... really going all out. Yeah, and they don't... Yeah, like, the, it, the quirks really. of the model series model really adds to, to... It really adds character to the chase. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... It's like I was saying earlier, I feel like this is a really good example of how they use the medium they had to its advantage. Like, they use the limitations yeah. and such to highlight the story. It works really well. <laughs> yeah. I, I said before, I love the shot of the two of them, like, drawing alongside one another, and then it raises up to go over the over the footbridge. Oh, yeah, that's really good. And then it kind really of comes good. back down to them. <laughs> It's so good. It's so good. Like, you can barely tell when you're watching the episode that it's just the same set redressed over and over. Yeah. Like, it, you, it's you can, so you, cool. You can track it because of the two points that just stick out on James's line. And, like, I never noticed it as a kid. But, like, looking at it as an adult, I don't look at it and think, wow, it's so it's so cheap of them to only have the one line. It's, it's only have this one stretch of line. I look and I think, wow... They really hit that well. Yeah. That's impressive. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like, they run past, like, the bridge, and there's, like, a lumber yard there for a second. It's like... Yeah. They show it as You know, it looks far. like... Yeah. It's just... This is also another thing I had, like, a dear I had, like, the, from Mari mentioning that Edward's kind of rocking back and forth, is... Imagine if, in, like, a re-adaptation that kind of brings in kind of the more dire aspects of this... We actually see Edward, like, breaking down, kind of similar to Hero, in that one sequence oh, of Hero of the Rails. Oh god, like, the Hero... Oh, that'd be... That'd be fucking rad. I don't know if you could, like, feasibly get it to be that as dire as Hero in Hero of the Rails. No, but imagine, but, like, yeah, imagine, like he's actively anything. breaking... Imagine he's, like, actively breaking down. Like, like he's cool. shaking some bolts loose, and they're just yeah. falling out as he rolls along. Yeah, just... <laughs> And then the idea that, like, he gets, he gets James, and he is in a terrible way. And then he still does the, well, I guess the old eye and caught you after all. 
Yeah. Just <laughs> this this book this book would do so well with CGI. It, it, it really would. I mean, I think all of the books would do really well with yeah. a CGI makeover. But like this one is, is especially lending itself well to some of this stuff. Yeah. But I mean, even the one for this story, even the version we got is still really good. Oh, yeah. the version of the TV series is great. The- yeah, it's it's awesome. Like, uh, you know, again, one of my favorite episodes as a kid. I love it. The, still love it. The main it. way I remember seeing this episode as a kid was it was on um the Ten Years of Thomas DVD, which was not officially, but like basically supposed to be a best of sort of compilation and like this is one that definitely deserved to be on there. <laughs> like it's on there for yeah, a good reason. Absolutely. They also I, had they I think they also had the Mavis episodes on there, which, you know, deserved. She's a queen. <laughs> uh I also I love the I I love the way that it's very clearly just a guy flinging like a like a little noose of rope over the like the large scale buffer for that one yeah. shot. Oh, you know what? That's something that would also be really cool in CGI is if it was like if it actually became, like, a proper lasso. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Because <laughs> I think I think that's kind of meant to be the intent. Okay, now it's yeah. like he's, like, actually, like, lassoing and throwing it. CGI and lasso just made me think of the fucking Earl, like, standing on Edward's foot <laughs> plate trying to fucking lasso James. <laughs> Which okay, I feel but, like would be but, really fun. <laughs> okay, but imagine... Like a joke where the inspector shows up and he's ready, and it's like, okay, it, with a bit of luck, we'll catch James. And then Sir Robert's just in the yard for some reason. He's like, we're doing what? <laughs> that sounds like a fun adventure. Let's go. <laughs> Come on, Edward. <laughs> it is absolutely the kind uh, of thing he would do. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, uh, Your Grace. Should we wait for the inspector to get up? You knocked him out when you pushed him over. He'll be fine. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to do this on my world adventure. <laughs> and then the fantasy and, and sequence then, is just a scene of him in fucking America, like riding a he's horse. He's the one. He, no, he's the one who did it in America. He's oh damn. He's, he's fucking there when like they pull up like Thomas with the horse and fucking big world. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just imagining, oh, yeah. like, I'm imagining that he, he's the one who caught the runaway engine this was based on while he was on a journey. <laughs> the guy, yeah, and this he was Bo. He, 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 Bo. You, it's where he met Bo, the American engine. Are we getting a? God. Available now in Bachman trains. I've, I've gone through an arc partially because of like you know the Bachman stuff, but also you know re- one. One friendo on Tumblr made like a really good. I, I forget who it was, so I'm sorry, but uh, ma- made a post about how Bo is actually like pretty cool for like kind of sort of filling in the trilogy of like you know engines who have a morbid tale to tell about not being a dipshit on the railways. <laughs> but it's like you know in a very it, it's not very heavy handed because you know since Thomas is already derailed, he's just like you know. He doesn't even tell Thomas he'll end up like that engine. He just, you know, says, you know, he just kind of leaves it there for Thomas to interpret himself what that means. <laughs> You're gonna fucking die, dude. <laughs> uh, steady, Edward. The inspector stood on Edward's front, holding a noose of rope in the crook of the shunter's pole. He was trying to slip it over James's buffer. The engine swayed and lurched. He tried again and again. More than once he nearly fell off, but he just saved himself. At last. Got him! He shouted. He pulled the noose tight and came back to the cab safely. Gently braking so as not to snap the rope, Edward's driver checked the engine's speed, and James's fireman scrambled over and took control. God, that must have been so fucking scary, like, just going across the two cabs. Yeah. Like, holy shit. I also love, like, again, I love the rope lasso things, and I think it's really cool... It looks a lot cooler in the books. Yeah, it because, does. Because, like, you can actually see the ropes tied to Edward yeah. for support. You can you see know. the ropes tied to Edward, you can see him holding on, which is... kind. Of, it's a limit of the, the models, like, the people models, is they couldn't do dynamic poses very well. Yeah. Yeah. 
They also, you know, wouldn't have a very easy time showing the inspectors close calls with death. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they do a decent job with what they have, like, posing. Oh, they do. It, it looks cool. It's like, yeah. They do the best they can. It just so happens that... Yeah, there's you know, still not much. There's only, there's only so much that can be done. Yeah. Apparently, according to the wiki... For the close-up shot of the rope, like, hooking the buffer, they used Thomas's close-up model, but removed- Oh, yeah, because it's-, it's Oh, that makes they sense. They removed the it's, lamp Because that, so like, actually tell. had a front that they could use. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, no, that, it's- You can tell because it's the same buffers they use in those shots in, um, Thomas and the Trucks. Huh. Yeah. And, like, Thomas is trained, too, I think. Yeah. Because I was wondering, like, if they made a, cl- like, how they did that, like, if they made a close-up model or something, but that's smart they probably just use. Yeah. That's probably why it's so closely zoomed in, so that you can't see the, you can't see the dip. It, it yeah. makes for a good shot. <laughs> yeah. It really does. It's really cool. They, they do- a- This is a good one. Yeah, this really is. They do- it, It's, it's so good. They, they do a lot- you can really tell they they did a lot to what they um with what they had and it, it pays off really well. <laughs> I yeah. I, I guess this is the thing people always say limitations breed creativity. Yeah. And they they yeah. did really well with the limitations. Yeah. I didn't even think of it till we talked cool. about it earlier, but like really, the, I feel like this is like almost a better example of the the strength of the model visuals than yeah flying kipper because like that that episode is really pretty like it, it absolutely is but like i i feel there's like there's nothing in it yeah it, nothing happens this is a good showcase of what you can do like if you get creative basically which yeah. is a big yeah, part of the like, appeal yeah because like the book like because when you read the book you can see all the stuff that they had to cut out of it just to make it work and it's but still then, good. When you see what they made, it's like, you know, wow, they had to they cut a lot of stuff out of this, but the way they made it work was so good. Yeah. yeah. It does what an adaption should do, basically. It brings it to the new medium in a way that uses that to its full advantage, even if it means it, having yeah. to it cuts, work with changes. It cuts the stuff. It cuts the stuff that doesn't work and amplifies the stuff that could. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Anyway, <laughs> I'm. I just. Please do more physical media. Please, please do more stuff with models and puppets and stop motion. Please, please. Yeah. I, I look. Um, I'm. I got neurodivergent autism brain. My. I, I like when stuff's physically made and I can look at it and see like, oh, that could move. I like Kermit. Kermit's good. Do more with him. That's the point. Fuck fuck the railway series. We're doing a Muppet Show podcast now. There were just <laughs> as many kids around the the big like Gage One Ellsbridge layout they had at Greenberg as there were like older fans and stuff there's there's definitely still an appeal <laughs> in that yeah. sort of thing yeah it's, it's just i think physical media in general is very special like and that's not to say that like animated stuff isn't well made because it is there's so much incredible like 2d and 3d animated stuff but like there are some things where like the weight and the gravity and the importance of certain things just can't be properly replicated without it being something that you could physically touch yeah yeah it's easy it's easier to give things weight when there actually is something with weight there yeah. <laughs> this this is you know i'm talking about train chases the train chase in wallace and gromit we all know what i'm talking about with this that yes. wouldn't be anywhere near as fun if it was just 3d animated like I don't. I feel like the stop motion is what makes that sequence so so memorable. It's just yeah. I feel like the, the point point is corporations. I know you're watching this podcast about Thomas the Tank Engine. Do more physical media. Um, I'll kill you. This is an active threat. <laughs> uh, 
Please no, we don't want any <laughs> okay. we don't want any Kanye moments on this podcast. The engines puffed back side by side. So the old iron caught you after all, chuckled Edward. I'm sorry, whispered James. Thank you for saving me. That's all right. You were splendid, Edward. The VAC controller was waiting, and thanked the men more warmly. A fine piece of work, he said. James, you can rest, and then take your train. I'm proud of you, Edward. You should go to the works, and have your worn parts mended. Oh, thank you, sir, said Edward happily. It'll be lovely not to clank. I like that James apologizes. Yeah. yeah. And I also think it's really funny that he still has to go back and take his train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, he has to go all the way back and just take it as if today's events haven't fucked the entire train schedule to hell and back. I, like, I think that ship has sailed. I do find it really interesting that this is a story where, like, James is an asshole in the beginning, but he doesn't technically do anything wrong afterwards yeah like, like none, of, none of what happened to him was his own fault yeah it's just you know it like it's very sundry and karma that this did happen and he did have to go after edward but none of this was his fault yeah and as a result i i really appreciate that this wasn't one of those moments where the fat controller ascribes blame to the engines when yeah. it really is the crew's fault <laughs> yeah i feel like that's something there's definitely some raider raider what the fuck <laughs> later railway series stories that do it and i think the tv series has problems with that a lot of the time but like it it's nice not to see it here <laughs> like that yeah yeah, and James genuinely apologizing is sweet. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, am I wrong, or is this the final appearance of Fat Controller 1? Uh, actually, I, I've been neglecting to bring it up throughout the entire book. I'm pretty sure this book is the first time Fat Controller 2 is used, timeline-wise. Oh. So this I, is the I, first Google appearance it? of Fat Controller 2. I I, I knew it was either I know it was either the last appearance of Topham or the first appearance of Charles. Yeah. And what's up, man? And you know, I I have I have thoughts about Charles Hat. You know, not that like you know, this is not the kind of normal thought one would having have reading through the railway series th for the first time because most people reading the railway series for the first time. You know, don't think about that. Don't know about the delineation between the hats. But like when you're reading it with that in mind. You can tell sort of a shift in leadership dynamics. Yeah, Char Charles is a Charles is a very different character. Yeah, like the f it's not quite clear here, just because he only has like this one line so far. But like once we get on to like other books, like Percy's book and uh, you know Twin Engines and stuff, you can tell there's a bit of a like you know. A shift in the way he does things. He's he's more involved with the engines. Yeah. Which one of the fat controllers yeah. is a twink? <laughs> um, none of them. They're the fat controllers. No, but the the the, the, the one there's the one in enterprising engines. They all laugh about the fact that he's not fat. And uh, that, question whether that's he has Richard a Hatch, I guess. Who. That would be Richard, who is Steven's son, yeah. and uh, canonically is a not fat controller yet. Yeah, because uh, oh, okay. <laughs> no, we we learned that we learned that I think earlier this year, late last year, because someone someone asked Chris some questions. It's like, has has Richard taken over yet? No, it's still Steven, who I think is in his eighties now. Yeah. He's just not giving just, the job. He's, he's just not like letting my, his son take he's over. He's like the fucking high school, my high school um, TV production teacher, who also did like the chorus and stuff, where like, he was, the school was trying to force him out so badly, and he just absolutely refused. And according to some of my friends, he went on a thing where he was like, the only way I'm living in this school is in a box! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. So that's on, him. Wait. He was born. He was born in 1941. Oh, so he yeah, he's he's 81. 
He took over the railway in, according to this, ninth, according to the wiki, 1984 is the first year that he was operating the railway. So, yeah, he's been run. He's been running things for fucking forty years. He's in his eighties, and he won't retire. <laughs> the only way out of leaving this railway is in a box. <laughs> Interestingly, this would, is also this, you... is, this is also the one who brought Toby home. This is also the the, <laughs> the, the kid, the kid who took Toby home from his holiday. <laughs> so he's just been there through through the whole thing. Yeah. God. The hat lineage is so fucking fun. Yeah. I like I, I feel like I feel like that's something that you kinda, you know I feel like that's something we gain out of the hat you know, living under Santa Claus rules and, you know, just having a lineage that goes on forever. It's just that like you know, you have little distinctions between the different hats. But at their core, they all they're they're still fucking eccentric weirdos. Yeah. I did kinda when I was trying to like plan out something I was considering writing, I, I kinda ran into a problem of like, oh yeah, it doesn't make sense for the same guy to be in like the fucking forties in like twenty twenty. <laughs> well, in fairness in fairness, the fat controller is a grandfather in the show. And his mother is still running around. I mean, to be fair, that's not abnormal. And no, we also, but like... We also we know, know, with how active she is, that could be abnormal. But we also know that Dowger Hat does not operate under mortal rules, so... Wait, this, is the, yeah. this is the thing, right? Bertram Hat, who is the one in the entire CGI series, and presumably the entire model series, is... The one who built Glyn, and was apparently the second controller, so he would be the stand-in for Charles. So he's been operating the railway since the 40s, and based on the nebulous, vaguely 60s, vaguely 70s canon of the CGI series, he's been running the railway for about 30 years. So... I, f- I think I think they're all just time lords. I think the the hat family just are all immortal. I, I guess maybe you could spin it as like he's like <coughs> sixty and maybe built Glenn in like his twenties or something. Actually, and wait, like, no, because the, the TV series on. takes place a bit like the early events take place a bit later than they did in. Yeah. So because he is still the grandfather of Stephen and Bridget, who were, you know, they're the fat control of... He's fat control of three, so Bertram would technically be fat control of one. So he'd be Topham Hat. So then there'd be a... a there's a, another mysterious Topham Hat before Topham Hat. Because we know from... Well, yeah, don't you remember the fucking Tom Soros Rex? He was little Topham Hat first. Well, was... yeah, but, but so the episode, the episode with fucking Winston and the stupid coach in season sixteen would imply that, like, he built Glynn when he was ten. <laughs> he drew Glynn on a piece of paper, and the the workers were so desperate for something to run the line, they were like, "Fuck it, just build it." <laughs> and he got to watch and, like, hold something every once in a while. So he built Glenn in the respect that he was there for it. <laughs> he, built, <laughs> he built Glenn in the same way that Elon Musk founded Tesla. Yeah! Exactly! <laughs> I, I like the CGI series in a lot of ways. If you think about the timeline of that for more than two seconds, your brain is going to explode. You, you're not yeah. meant to. Yeah. It's, it's basically... I feel like the TV series takes a lot from more modern cartoons and, like, sitcoms and stuff where, like... It basically exists in a vacuum, and you're kind of...
kinda not meant to think about the timeline or the time period. Yeah. And, like, by but the end... But that doesn't work for those shows either, because people still think about it. Yeah, no, it never does. It's just the kind of thing where it's, like... And they kind of focus more on, like, just what they want to do over the logistics of the Fat Controller building a Glen and, like, running the railway and all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the po- look, point is, the railway series is always really cool. But the TV series is really fun. They're both good. Don't be <laughs> shitty. Yep. Different appeals. Yeah. Yeah, also, uh, getting back to the book we were talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was one of our more on-topic tangents. <laughs> it was, honestly. But, like, you know, it... Yeah, it's still a tangent. <laughs> Words. The I forgot control- what I was going to say. The fact controller is um, Sodor's version of Muskrat. Yeah. Uh, oh, do you mean Muskrat is an Elon Musk? Yeah. No! <laughs> uh, anyway, the, ep- the, the TV episode, the TV episode just ends here, but the yeah. book continues for another page. And I assume this was due to time restraints, but it does make for a very good way to dodge dealing with what's on the next page. <laughs> there was also an extended sequence of 30 seconds of James just spinning that maybe they could have cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is he talking while he's spinning or not for uh, most maybe of towards it. the end? Yeah, but... no. He says Edward is impossible is when he's getting onto the table and the next line is not for a solid like ten, fifteen seconds. I know there's a shot of um the uh, so according to the wiki at least, there's an unused shot of the fireman like taking back control of James's cab. Or, like, whoever mm. steps over. So maybe maybe that was cut because they couldn't figure out how to make it flow properly with, like, the limited animation. I don't know if that's the word. I guess. They okay. had, and then they were just like, fuck it, just have James rotate on the turntable for another, like, <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> the two naughty boys were soon caught by the police, and their fathers walloped them soundly. They were also forbidden to watch trains till they could be trusted. James's driver soon got well in hospital, and is now back to work. James missed him very much, but he missed Edward more. And you will be glad to know that when Edward came home the other day, James and all the other engines gave him a tremendous welcome. The Fat Controller thinks he will be deaf for weeks. 1950s domestic violence! Yeah. <laughs> yeah! Outside of that, this ending is super cute. I, the, yeah, yeah, it it feels very much like those movies that end with a "Where are they now?" Uh, for the <laughs> cast members. Dewey Cox died three minutes after this performance. Edward. Yeah. Edward died of a drug overdose in 1975. <laughs> when no. I was just referencing, there's a movie called Walk Hard that's a parody of like music biopics. <laughs> And, like, he goes on stage, does his, like, big, like, comeback performance, and then it's just, like, the caption is just, like, it just fades to one of those, like, black and white images where, like, the caption comes up and it's, like, where are they now? And it's just, like, Dewey Cox died three minutes after this performance. <laughs> and it just Poochie. cuts back to footage and he starts having a heart attack. <laughs> he died on the way back from his home pa- to his home planet. <laughs> I, yeah, not much of note here, I think, other I, than that it's cute, and uh, the Fat Controller's getting his hearing damaged by all those whistles. Yeah. yeah. I, the, the like, James missed his driver, but, like, missed Edward even more is a really cute line, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, not cute is domestic violence. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- there, there is no justification for domestic violence in any context, literally yeah. all you can say is just, it it was a different time. That's the only thing you can say, Did really. Did they keep the line yeah. in the show? Or... Not and... that it was, not that it was, you know, good at the time. No, it it's wasn't. Just it was mo- just, we didn't realize like, you know, how bad it was Domestic violence, you know, beating terrorism. your children as a form of discipline oh, is no. not good, has never been good, and will never be 
I was wondering if they kept that line in the episode, and then I went back, and it's like, oh yeah, they cut before it. <laughs> they cut the whole page. Yeah, so. Which I, I definitely think probably was a mix of, like, time and, like. It's a very easy way to avoid dealing with it. The, you yeah. could also just cut the line and say they were found by the police and not allowed to watch trains. Yeah. Yeah, they could have rewarded it, too. They probably just didn't see it as... Yeah. Because the kids are more a plot device than anything. Yeah. This like, is, you can I'm kind of just... not bring them up without, like, really making it seem like the story is incomplete. Because it's like, especially in the show, we don't even see them. So, like... <laughs> well, we, we do... They are in the shot of James leaving. Oh, yeah. Huh. I, Never mind, I guess then. the thing is, they could have just cut down the shot of him on the turntable, and that would have given them more than enough time to go through most of this. Yeah. They... It... It It feels like they just cut this because they didn't feel like filming it. Kinda. Yeah. They also didn't I mean, have... to be fair, it, it would be kind of hard to, like, you know... I feel like reading this, it would kind of be hard to, like, do this... I don't know what the right word would be, like, correctly? I don't know. Not correctly, but, like, it would have been hard to kind of, like, do this type of page in the books, it, uh, in the TV series, just because it's, like, you know, yeah. not very, it, it's not very, there isn't a lot of tangible action, it's just kind of exposition about, you know, again, where are they now? Yeah. yeah. And, like, you know, they, they could have a scene... They could have a scene like the end of uh, A Close like... Shave, where it's literally just, you know, Edward on the turntable and the engines are celebrating him being home. I'll but, bet. like, they also do that for A Close Shave, so it would have been a bit repetitive, I guess. I bet yeah. you're wondering, where are they now? Oh my god. And they, and they is chunky. He's dead. He's dead. Um, <laughs> I like... I, I'm, I'm guessing they probably would have kept it if they were actually doing this in tandem with the Scarloe episodes. Yeah. Because, like, we obviously, in the next story, um, we see Edward going to the works, and then, yeah. like, that's not really addressed after, because it's not really the plot of that book, so they kind of just... But it, it is a nice bit of connecting here. tissue. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I like that a lot. I, I think it's a really clever way of especially setting up a whole new cast of characters by having it kind of continue off the last one. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, I feel like they probably figured they didn't really need that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Without it. I, I understand why they cut it, I just think they shouldn't have. Yeah, they could have they could have trimmed down the shot of James on the turntable to just be him backing into the shed and then complains and then just had like a 20 second scene at the end like Jamie was talking about with like Edward it's like oh like James missed his driver but was like happiest of all like or missed Edward more and like all the engines were happy to see him again yeah also Thomas is on this page hi Thomas yeah Tom and it's a... him it's Thomas the friend and a weird looking Henry I don't well, know that, yeah. that looks a bit weird to me. I think that's just because Dolby isn't very good. Here's the thing. This story made me think of it for some reason. I, I like Dolby's... Especially because we're getting near the end of his run. I actually really do like how Dolby draws the characters a lot. I think just consistency is kind of an issue. Well, no, his designs are good. It's just that he didn't give enough of a shit to actually draw them properly. I think what's off about this, Henry, is the fact that, like, they make his front very narrow, but his pilot wheels are very big. That's just kind yeah. of a running theme through this book, I'm kind of realizing, is that very big in his pilots. illustrations, he makes the pilot wheels on the engines very big. James and Edward look very squashed in certain things, and, like, I think the yeah. image where, like, the guy's standing next to Edward's wheels, like, they look huge. Well, in fairness, have yeah. you ever been next to a steam engine? Yeah, but I just mean relative to, like, how 
Edward is drawn in the thing because he looks Edward himself looks pretty squashed, but the wheels look huge. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So this story, this story is a fun ride. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know it. It's really fun. You know, both in the book and uh, in the TV version, it's really good. Like especially the presentation and execution of the chase scene. Yeah. And I I still love it as much as I did when I was a little kid. So. I think I'm gonna give this one to Douglas. Yeah, I honestly I'm the same. I Douglas too. This is probably my favorite we've done in a while. Like at least since Down the Mine and before that, I maybe even more than that. I don't remember what I ranked that one, uh, but like You gave Dirty Objects a nine and Toby and the Stout Gentleman a ten. Oh, okay. Yeah, so my favorite And also Birdie's Chase Oh wait, no oh wait, hold on, I'm looking at V's. Oops. Uh, yeah, the last ten you gave was Dirty Objects, yes. and Toby and the Stout Gentleman, though. I am so, Marina. Yeah. It was still correct, but... yeah, it, I, I am Marina. Those, sure. These are my opinions. <laughs> I love love live. <laughs> Not that long relative to stories, but pretty long relative <laughs> to our recording schedule. Yeah! I got you with that, that one, A huh? little bit. <laughs> I got you with that one a little bit, didn't I? You know, you nailed me to it perfectly. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really like this. I, I Literally, I, the only things I could think of that I would have liked more of is maybe more of Edward and James interacting and talking. But like, I I feel like that's the case of like any story at this point. Yeah. And also, like, what we have is still really good. So <laughs> yeah, I... I, I like this one a lot. It genuinely I, probably one of my favorites to this point. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is an interesting thing, which you normally bring up, Mari, which I think like um, is interesting that you didn't, which I guess just shows how good this story is. Edward doesn't have a line until the second to last page. Yeah. He, which... He... Oh, you well, actually, no, he, he has like one or two, but like he doesn't speak much. Like, yeah, like he laughs at the beginning, like his his presence, you know, his presence is you know I don't want to say incidental just because it's like you know no this isn't Edward's it's story, not definitely. like this wouldn't happen if this was like James and Henry no uh, because Henry would have caught know. him before he left the yard <laughs> yeah but like you know it like it makes sense for this to be James and Edward but like Edward doesn't really need Edward doesn't necessarily need to say much I guess just because you know. Well, it would be cool to hear what he thinks about this, you know, extremely dire situation. You know, I think he already knows that. Yeah. And, you know, he's not, you know... Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. <laughs> Jamie, you're cool. No, I, oh, I completely get what you mean and agreed with what you said. Yeah. It, Edward's... I feel like it works. Like I said, I would have liked more of Edward and James talking, but I feel like, in a weird way, this is very much Edward's story, and it's also not. Because, like, yeah. this Edward kicks off the story, because he's running late and, like, clanking, and James is like, hey, fuck you, you're gonna make me late, and then Edward just laughs at him, and then James goes and starts bitching about him to the kids... And the kids are like, hey, fuck you, dad's cool. <laughs> no, this is, this is like a 20-year-old man going to a couple of children and saying, I hate your dad. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> or like, or like the, the fucking, like, yeah, like the, I don't know, or like going to like the fucking, like, intern kids at the workplace. <laughs> Shitting on the boss. Or not the boss, because the kids would probably it's, agree, but you know what I mean. No, it's 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 James going over to like the intern like social media kids and being like, God, I hate I hate fucking old Jim, the weird mysterious janitor who gives you like cool gifts sometimes. Yeah, and they're like, fuck you, he's cool. <laughs> he's not even the problem. <laughs> it, it works no one, well. No one knows where he came from. But he will never leave. It's a weird case where, like, <laughs> I feel like it 
it functions really well as an Edward story, even if he doesn't do a lot. Because I feel like they managed to make it where he feels relevant throughout it in a way he doesn't usually in stories that try and replicate this formula. Like, I, yeah. I might be misjudging it, but like something like... I was going to say Edward the Really Useful Engine, but I don't remember if that's the season 6 one I'm referring to, or the season that's the, 17 that's the, one. That's the season 6 one. Yeah, no, Old Reliable Edward is the season 18 one. Okay, I was trying to remember, because the titles are kind of similar. But, like, the, the, compared to the episode where they do Edward and Gordon, but times two. <laughs> like, I, I feel like Edward feels relevant to the story. It begins and ends with him even if he doesn't have a lot of lines which yeah yeah it, edward's an interesting character in that regard i feel like he yeah. does a lot with a little one written well yeah yeah edward isn't a boring character you're just not good at writing yeah edward's not a perfect character either people just you know don't know what his flaws are yeah it Ed Edward's not boring or perfect, you just have poor media literacy. It really is interesting <laughs> that we started this podcast, I, or this book, I think, with, like, that season six and seven, the, like, hit era Bible getting leaked and, like, us all having read that. Because for all its flaws, I really do feel like they sum up Edward pretty well in they it. They do. It's yeah, he's a character that like isn't necessarily going to come to the forefront immediately all of the time, but is very easy to incorporate into stories if you if you think on it. And like he's yeah. definitely not one to be forgotten. And that's You yeah. Edward is Edward is not a character that you can ignore because if you don't give him the chance to show you what how good of a character he can be then he's you know he's never gonna like ever get to do anything it's just he's a good character if you give him the time of day which ironically is very similar thematic, to how he's... thematic shades of edward's day out there yeah, I was just no say. Yeah. it's it's like Ed, the way edward is treated as a character in a meta context is very similar to how he's treated as a character in a story context in the Everybody tends to overlook him, but if you give him a chance, you can see how incredible and how, like, like strong and how good of a character he really is. But most people just aren't interested because they're, they want to look at the more in interesting or flashy or big or strong or Thomas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at the more Thomas. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like... Well, you know, Edward, you know, he's cool and all, but he's not... He's not enough Thomas. That's an interesting... Is that, is that not what the parents are, the, are like, though? I feel like... True! There's, there's an interesting contrast to be brought up, because Edward is very much a character who achieves a lot of great things just through going about his day normally and trying to do the best he can at that. There's whereas, a reason the PA as, problems is his best CG episode. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, especially in this, like, later in the TV series, I feel like Thomas is the sort of character where he always wants something more, but ends yeah. up stumbling in very absurd situations and getting himself out of it in very strong ways through being himself. So, yeah, like, they're, they're, they're I... similar, but different and yeah i love the way you described thomas in the cgi series as stumbling into success <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that's the royal engine is honestly one of my favorite thomas stories just because i like if there was going to be a finale for the show i even if it wasn't intended to be one i think it is a very good one because it's literally just thomas stumbling into saving the day through just being himself and getting himself lost and confused and then helping someone because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And, like, I, I feel... Yeah. And you could say that, especially in the CGI series where they show that Thomas has learned a lot from Edward that, like, always 
just doing his best and doing the right thing is something he learned from Edward, because that's very much a part of his character in a I wish we see more way. of Thomas and Edward's dynamic after the adventure begins. Because every time they get to interact is so good. Yeah. yeah. I love, yeah. I love the scene Kara, in... Kara's been talking a lot about uh, Thomas and Edward interactions in season 19 recently. Yeah. And I, There's some good I very ones. much agree with their take that uh, a lot of those fucking slap and people are way too mean to season 19 in general. The, the, I don't remember I don't remember what episode it's in, but the sequence of Thomas is like, oh, you know, Philip's a bit of a handful. Oh, yes. He reminds me of a little engine who wanted to see the world. The fact they play the fucking, like, little instrumental of really useful engine while Thomas blushes is so cute. That's yeah, uh, Phyllis' debut, it's awesome. I think. It's, it, it's perfect. It's, it, it's interesting that that, prob- that episode probably wasn't originally written with The Adventure Begins being a thing in production in mind, but, like, it worked out perfectly, and I'm guessing they added that scene after that. But, like, yeah. it, it, it's really good. And, listen, I'm just gonna say, t- Edward's great. Edward is great. I love him. Like, you know, I guess the the whole point of this is, yeah, Edward, Edward does tend to get overlooked, both in canon and by writers. Both, like, fan writers and official writers, but just... Just think on him for a minute. Give him a chance. Think about his dynamics with other characters. He he is good. If you give him the time of day, you can make something incredible with him. There's a reason that so many of Wilbur's best stories are with him. Like, yeah. obviously, it's going to be a long time before we get there. Edward's exploit fucking slaps. It is so good. And that wouldn't work as well if it was Thomas. I love Thomas. He's great. That is an Edward story. Yeah. It's it's just like we don't, know, don't just write the the main blue fuck or the grumpy blue fuck. <laughs> write the old blue fuck. He's good. Yeah. Or the... make sure that when you write the old blue fuck it's, you know, the the the, the words I'm forgetting. Fuck. You did your best. It's, it's I think <laughs> It's, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm guessing you mean, like, don't... People tend to either write Edward as completely perfect, or, like, the writers in the show did for a while, where his character trait is just that he's old. Yeah. And, like... Yeah. It, it, don't do those, but, like... Yeah, like, write him as a character because yeah. he's, like, he's interesting you know, <laughs> yeah because like, yeah, like you know edward edward can be cheeky edward can be impatient edward you know there are a whole lot of things that edward can be while still being edward yeah he's he's like he's cheeky he's impatient he's street smart he's knowledgeable he's got a lot of connections with a lot of people She's like awesome. he's yeah and you know in some ways, he's very... He's a little bit impulsive with just how immediately he wants to help Trevor. He has character traits. Look for them. Use them. Douglas. He's... <laughs> Perfect. So, so, this is our first story where all all ten, all ten, all three scores are tens. Wow. Holy shit. <laughs> honestly, fitting one for it. I... Yeah. Yeah, honestly. I'm I, sorry I delayed like, my m- ranking so long. I have no, a lot to say. That was perfect. It's okay. I Honestly, I think it's for a while. I think it's pretty perfect for us to start waxing poetic about the nature of Edward as a character at the end of his book. Yeah. <laughs> I I want to say one thing that like you caught me thinking with that. I feel like one thing they also show in this book is that I don't know how to word it cuz I feel like passive is wrong, but like Edward is the kind of like, a lot of these stories are, st- we've talked about this a lot, is, like, kind of stuff happening around him or him ending up in situations by basically, like, like, because Cows was, like, Gordon and Henry, like, kind of shitting on Edward, and then yeah. Toby's like, hey, fuck you, and, like, Edward leaves, and then they get their comeuppance, and Edward's just kind of there to laugh about it 
afterwards. Yeah. And, like, this kind of the same thing where, like, James is, like, as we said, probably not, like, a genuine dislike of him, but just through being James, it's like, oh, you're so slow and old, like, blah, blah, blah. And then Edward just laughs at it. Like, he just laughs it off, and, like, technically some of it is true, because Edward was, like, it's established in the story that he needed repairs, he was clanking a lot, but, like, then he just, when, like, the situation calls for it, he just, like, does the right thing, and, like, still yeah. pushes himself. It's, he's not a passive character, but he's also, it feels he like Edward's- It feels like he doesn't have anything to prove. Yeah. Yeah. Edward's not the kind of character like, say, like, Thomas or Percy that would retort to someone. Like, say, like, a story where, like, Gordon or James or Henry, I guess, are, like, being a dick. And then you get, like, someone else retorts back at them, and that's what kicks off the story. This yeah. one is literally just Edward laughs it off at the beginning. Which... Which, Which I don't is... think any other character ever does in this entire series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Which even is... Toby, who is, you know, kind of considered Edward's closest equal, even though they are very different characters. When da when Daisy sets him off, she sets him off. He he retorts. <laughs> even yeah, same point. thing with James in Dirty Objects, and in Double Header. And, yeah. he, and he gets really mad at Mavis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, Toby Toby does not have the same... I guess he just... I mean, he can be cool-headed, but not in the same way as Edward. Because, like, Toby, you know... Toby has a point where he'll want to try and set people straight. Yeah. yeah. Like... And there's also, you know, closest example. He doesn't want to help Mavis. He just says, fuck you, do it yourself. <laughs> Yeah, it's only because they point out that other people are probably suffering because of her idiocy that he's like, fine, yeah. <laughs> I'll move five feet to the left and help her. <laughs> God. Whereas yeah, Edward is like, he doesn't have anything to prove, and he knows that even if James was rude, helping him is the right thing to do, so he just does yeah. it. Yeah. Edward is the kind of character that would probably stick up, for, that would definitely stick up for someone else, but, like, in his situation, he just kind of knows, like, he's content with himself. He doesn't have necessarily to prove anything yeah. to these people, because he it's always James. ends what up is... doing it through circumstance yeah. anyway, too. Edward doesn't have to prove himself to fucking James. <laughs> I. Th this is also another thing, because I'm thinking about fucking Mean Scarlet Deceiver posts, because I always am when I'm talking about Thomas. They do Edward so good. Like, they really do. Edward's, Edward's stuff is some of my favorite stuff in. Like, that, that's part of why Ex Condor is one of my favorite things ever. Not just because it's such good. Please finish it. Not just not just because it's such. Huh? Please finish it. Please. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to put pressure on you since you're, you're and I'm so honored that you're listening, but please, <laughs> but <laughs> oh, right. uh, what was I saying? Right. Uh, X Condor is really good. Not just because it has really good, like, you know, anal content and analysis of Boko as a character, but it also does a lot for Edward's character in the yeah. process. Cause we get to, we get to see him through fresh eyes that aren't familiar with steam engines so much. Yeah. At least not steam engines like Edward. So you get to kind of, like, learn. Like, learning about him through new eyes really makes you, like... I don't have the words anymore. They've left my brain. Oh, <laughs> no, I get what you, you, you know, mean. it's, it's, it's really, it's eye-opening is what it is. Yeah. There, there's a really good sequence in, I think, like, the second chapter, where Boko's just broken down. Like... He's broken down, he's stuck on the line, Edward comes out to help him, and then, like, Boko whispers to, I think, one of his crew, one of his, like, two work, two, two drivers, like, does he pull actual trains? And then we just hear from Edward, yes, and I'm mainline certified, too. <laughs> My hearing's pretty good as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then there's the, there's the scene in the yard where they talk, where Edward just starts talking about, like, I think she's called, like, like Mrs. Cat Eyes or something. Just, like, this old weird witch he the used witch to know. Yes, yeah, The really Witch of Wellsworth, yes, that's really good. Yeah, The Witch of Wellsworth. Don't, just... let, let's not spoil that. Y'all need to read that for yourselves. So, moving on to the book as a whole, I, you know, time time for ranking the books. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I feel like, you know, I was going to say that it left a lot to be desired about being a book about Edward, but we just talked at length about how, you know, Edward, things happen around Edward and that's how he's the central character. So I feel like that's kind of a moot point. Yeah. Uh, now, now that we've, <laughs> now that that's been said and done, but so that just kind of leaves it with being a pretty damn good book. It has a great balance of both funny moments and enthralling action. And, you know, I, it's just, it's really good. I, I think I give it a duck. That is completely fair. I, I feel kind of the same way. I, I've kind of not really made it. Oh, secret, the fact that I've kind of been waiting, I guess, for like the, for lack of a better term, the one where the series gets going. And like, there, there's certainly been some good books before this. Obviously, I love Thomas's is by far the best one, but like, I, I, I like like Toby's and I, I like Troublesome Engines a lot more than I, I thought I did prior. But like, I... I thoroughly really like this. Like yeah. more than I ever thought I would have going into it. I this is probably my favorite one since Thomas's book. And like apart from Old Iron, I wouldn't even call any of the stories prior to this necessarily among like my top favorites, but like they're all really solid. They use the world really well, and I think Edward is an interesting character to explore the world with because of what we said, where he's not necessarily passive, but he's very much a person that interacts with his world, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, like, yeah, yeah I, I like this a lot. Honestly, Donald, from me, I... The, probably a bit generous but like i overall i think this is a really really good package it it's very much ed like edward and in something that could go under the radar but it is really good <laughs> like i i'd argue the book as a whole is somewhat greater than the sum of most of its parts and that's that's not a bad thing <laughs> like i i think it's really yeah. good i like this a lot I'm excited to see what's next. Well, obviously yeah. I know what's next, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and the next one's even. Well, if you know what's next, you know it's going to be really good. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that too. <laughs> so. we, are, we are out of Audrey's growing pains era. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm excited in the fact that I'm not having the, oh my god, where my memory's lying to me <laughs> thoughts yeah. anymore. No more crisis of faith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be even more generous. I'm, I'm gonna say Douglas. I really oh, like shit. this one. I love this one a lot. I, you know, they're not all perfect, which maybe would say doesn't deserve a Douglas, but I had fun. And I think when you're reading a book that is for children, it is for children. I don't care what you say on Twitter. It is a children's series. And I had fun. I enjoyed myself. And I think that's the important thing. That's what and matters. I think Yeah. I think in a lot of ways Edward kind of mirrors himself in every aspect of the series. In the He as a character in the stories tended to get overlooked, but they gave him a chance and he showed he showed what he could do. The writers tend to overlook him, but when they finally got to grips with him, he was great. And this book is one that I don't see talked about very much, but 
I think if you look into it and you give it the chance that it deserves, you'll see just how wonderful it is. Yeah. Give Edward more of a chance, is what I'm saying, in every aspect. He's good. Please. Yeah. <laughs> I think I mentioned this, um, at the beginning, but I... There was a point in the past where I kind of forgot this book existed, and I thought Mainline Engines was Edward's book for some reason, even though, like, in the back of my head, <laughs> I knew that was wrong. But I still thought it. But, like, that that's a massive disservice to this, because it's its really good. Like, yeah. It's genuinely really good. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. <laughs> and it's, and it's I enjoyed it a whole Edward lot more. Book. I enjoyed it a whole lot more because I get to read it with my two buds. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love doing this show with y'all. It, it's it's so, Yeah. It's really fun. So that's the end of Edward the Blue Engine. Uh, Probably so 2022 with our release schedule. Roadmap for content real quick before we go. Uh, hopefully this episode's going up sometime towards the end of December. If not, uh... Oops. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, and... I'm gonna try and get it up. Uh... Things, things are, things have been messy this year, and we apologize. Yeah, for that. yeah, think, yeah. We're, we, we can only resolve to do better next year. <laughs> but for the month of January, content's probably gonna be pretty light. Uh, so we're planning on hopefully t uh, putting out a pilot for something new. Mm. Yes. Uh, you know, we'll 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 see more about that later. And it's not um, Archie Mega Man, which a, a, makes me a person, sad. A personal pet project of mine, so that that can be afraid. Yeah. That, yeah. Be a... Well, no, don't be afraid. Look forward to it. It's gonna be great. <laughs> and it it, um, it is actually Thomas related. I haven't um, I it's spoilers. I guess I haven't convinced them on the Love Live fan fiction podcast yet. So. <laughs> I. I will suffer through Love Live fanfiction if we can do Archie Mega Man. Uh, so, so we have that coming, which should hopefully be in the uh, former half of January. Uh, you know, or maybe maybe earlier, depending on if we can swing it. But I, I wouldn't want to push our luck. Um, and then at the end of January or the beginning of February, we are going to be. Obviously, since that's when the Bachman catalog is coming back, that's when the next episode of the Bachman Roundtable is going to be. Yeah. Uh, oh and God. hopefully during during January, like during the rest of the month and during like January and February, we will figure out a way to stabilize our schedule. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no promises, but like... Hopefully you know, things we're, will we're, be a bit less chaotic. <laughs> we're doing hopefully. the best we can, we promise. I got moved yeah. to a three to midnight shift like two weeks ago. I stayed up till four and slept in until like two thirty a couple days <laughs> ago. So we're doing our best. <laughs> we're doing yeah. our best, and we want to we want to do more for you because we have a lot of fun doing it. But also, uh, life's a bitch. Yep. But you know who's not a but bitch? Yeah. Edward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know who is a bitch? Uh, Jamie. Oh. <laughs> I love you, Jamie. Well, you're I'm not sorry. a bitch. I'm sorry. You're, I love honestly, you. <laughs> you're the entire reason this show is even possible. So yeah, no, ev everything will fall apart with that. Everybody in the server, everybody in the Discord, you're on the Discord, everybody in the Discord, <laughs> when you get to this part, Say thank you, Jamie. God damn it. Say thank you, Jamie, for being very cool and making a good show because Jamie's cool and she made a good show. It's only as good as it is because you two are here, but thank you. Well, even so, it's it's your baby and the show you deserve the credit for that. If you really need a compromise, the show wouldn't be what it is without each of us and without all of you watching so yeah yeah thank you everybody for watching this episode of the railway series book club we promise things will hopefully be better next year <laughs> yeah whoa two books we covered two whole books throughout one year we let's actually go actually fucking finished this i didn't i knew we i knew we could i think it only took us like four months to do this three months to do this book rather than 
the, the nine that is true new gordon so we're, we're we're on track if we're at the rate we're going where it reduces by a third or two thirds <laughs> we might be able to get the book the next book done in a month or two hopefully maybe <laughs> my my real lofty ambition is that we can hopefully finish season two of the podcast by the end of next year. What's... I don't think that'll happen un- unless we get our shit together, but like... What's the end of s- season two? Uh, a t- Eight Famous Engines. So that's like, that's only three books. Yeah, I think we can do it. That is actually a pretty low bar now that yeah. I think of it, but I'm not gonna jinx it. <laughs> Ow. My table's wood, I just hit it, so hopefully... Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully... No, I did it to, to, to prevent bad luck. Like, knock on wood. I'm gonna do that too with the fucking cabinet right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> me, you gotta hit something. <gasps> Bye, I, everyone. I, pun- I punched my bed, now my hand hurts. Can <laughs> <laughs> I end the episode Goodbye, on that? Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm in pain, I'm in pain, doing this show hurt me, do 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 do